See you.
Hi everyone, welcome to the family service for this Sunday. My name is James Beck, I'm an intern here at St. Matt's and it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Especially a huge welcome if you're new too. Um, we'd love to hear from you, so feel free to click on the communication card at the top so we can get in touch with you. Now, you're probably wondering, why do I have photos of the Queen Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, and Baz, our Senior Minister of the two churches? Well, all of them have some type of authority and power. For example, one of the Queen's authority or power is that she is the head of the British Empire. Scott Morrison has the authority over Australia and the governments. And Baz has authority over our two churches. He cares for them and helps us. But even though they may be in charge of many things, they do not have authority over everything. They can't control the wind or the waves, which would be pretty funny to see the Queen try, but their power is limited. Today, we're actually going back into the book of Luke, where Chippo will be preaching to us about how Jesus has true authority and power over everything. The wind, the waves, evil spirits, you name it. This makes us want to tell our family and friends about the great news he has done in our lives. So before we sing, I'm just going to pray. Dear God, thank you so much that Jesus is powerful and he has authority over everything. I pray that um, when we hear the talk, that um, it would help us uh, go out and tell everyone about this amazing news. Amen. Well, it is time for our memory verse challenge, and today we have a brand new memory verse to remember uh, for the next four weeks. 
So it's Matthew chapter 28, verse 17 to 19, which says, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In this merry verse, we see that all authority has been given to Jesus. And he has asked us to go out everywhere and to make followers of him. Now, for this challenge, we are going to sing um, the merry verse, which is awesome. But I have a special treat for you. The legendary Dave Parker and his family have created a song for us to help us learn the merry verse. So feel free to sing it or feel free to listen. Um, but I'm going to take it uh, to Dave now. Hi, everyone. Uh, this week we are starting a new series from the book of Luke and it's all about the authority of Jesus. And uh, today's theme is water, he's by the lake, so we thought we would uh, join that theme. And for our memory verse, we've made a bit of a song, and so we hope you enjoy it, we hope it's helpful for you. And, um, and uh, here it is, join when you catch it along. When they saw him, they worshipped. Others doubted, couldn't figure it. Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. When they saw him, they worshipped. Others doubted, couldn't figure it. Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. One more. They saw him, they worshipped. Others doubted, couldn't figure it. Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Now you've got to go make disciples in my name. <laughs> Matthew 28 70 to 19. There you go. So we're going to put that up on Facebook so you can learn it throughout the week and we'll do it again next week. See you then. Good morning, St. Matt's and All Saints. My name is Jason. I attend the 10 a.m. service at St. Matt's. I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke this morning, starting from chapter 8, verse 22. One day... Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake, so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. 
A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Friends, let me start by introducing you to a man commonly known as Uncle Drew. Now, Uncle Drew is a basketball legend who popped up on YouTube in 2012. He went viral because this old guy would turn up to local games and want to play with the young bloods, as he would call them. And of course, nobody wanted to play with him. After all, who would want to embarrass and disrespect an old guy like this? But Drew insisted, and as expected, he was pretty slow and unskilled. But before long, he started warming up, doing things like this. He turned up, young blood. I can smell it. Oh! Oh! It's amazing! I'm dropping a bit. Get the block. Watch your back. Doesn't that guy's face at the end say it all? He's thinking to himself, who is this old man? And if you watch the clip through to the end, we learn exactly who Uncle Drew is. He's not old at all. He's one of the greatest basketball players in the world, Kyrie Irving. And this whole thing was a promotional stunt to advertise Pepsi Max. See, when an ordinary looking person does the extraordinary, you can't help but wonder who on earth they are and where they've come from. If Kyrie Irving had performed those moves as himself, nobody would be surprised. But Uncle Drew, now that's a whole different ball game. And this is the same question those who walked and talked with Jesus were faced with. Who is this guy? This passage re-enters us back into our series in Luke's Gospel, which we started earlier in the year. The section is all about Jesus' authority. He's just been sharing some of his most famous parables and Luke now goes from Jesus' teachings to Jesus' actions, both of which serve to show who he really is. This section shows that deep Jesus is not just all talk, but he backs up the authority he teaches with, with his actions. We see two miracles today, the calming of the storm and the healing of the demon-possessed man. And did you notice how extreme both situations are? These aren't just little problems, they're huge problems, and they're going to need huge solutions. For example, verse 23, it's not just drizzling with rain, it's a squall. The waters are raging. Verse 30, this is not just a mildly troubled man. No, his possession is so overwhelming that his name is Legion, with oppression so strong that guards and chains have not been able to control him. If Uncle Drew is who he seems on the surface, then surely he can't demolish his opponents. But Kyrie Irving, now that would be a different story. The words of the disciples in verse 25 reflect what was on that spectator's face in the video. When they say, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. Their question reveals something about the relationship between Jesus and other forces whether it be a weather pattern or spiritual possession. 
And Luke wants to make it very, very clear for us where the authority lies. Verse 24, Jesus has the authority to rebuke the wind and the raging waters. We haven't seen anything like that since God parted the Red Sea in Egypt. But that was God. This is the carpenter's son. Verse 28, the best the demon can do is to beg at Jesus' feet. He has no authority over the Christ, only servitude. Verses 31 and 32, the only thing the legion can do is to beg not to be sent into the pigs. And that legion may have had mastery over the man, but they have no mastery over the Christ. And verse 37, the people in the region of the Gerasenes may be fearful, but the best they can do is simply to ask Jesus to leave. And so time and time again in these two events, we see that Jesus has full and complete authority. And just like there are two miracles, there are two responses to those miracles. It's so interesting that we've just come out of a series on fear of the Lord, because here we see two types of fear come through in the responses to Jesus. The first kind of fear is seen in the disciples' question, again in verse 25, that it's in fear and amazement that they ask one another, who is this? In contrast, when Jesus heals the demon-possessed man, the locals have a different kind of fear. Verse 37, we read, Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave. Why? Because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. Two miracles, two responses. One kind of fear that leads to amazement, and another kind of fear that is so threatened that the people don't know what to do with Jesus, except beg him to leave. There is no neutrality with this man. You can't see someone healed and not wonder what's going on. And then there's the demon-possessed man himself. Look at how he responds to the authority of Jesus. Can you imagine waking up one morning in utter torment, preparing for another day of torture, only to have a stranger come across the lake and put you in your right mind, able to converse, be clothed and in control? That is what I call a transformed life. And how does he respond? Well, he wants more of this Jesus guy, and I would too, I'd imagine you would as well. We read that the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. This man who 10 verses earlier begged Jesus not to torture him, now begs Jesus to let him follow. But Jesus has other plans. He sends him away, saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Jesus empowers this man into a ministry of the gospel. We're going to see more and more in the next chapter of Luke, this call to spread the news, but also the discomfort that it will bring. And isn't that true for us? Because on the one hand, we have this great gospel message, but on the other hand, we don't like that it's uncomfortable. But Jesus sends this man back into the region that has just asked Jesus to leave. That's what I call an uphill battle. We believe we have the power of Christ, but we don't like getting rejected. The passage shows some responding with awe, others with gratitude and others with fear. What do we do with that? And I want to challenge you today with the words that Jesus challenges the demon possessed man with to return home and tell how much God has done for you. And you may well say, but I haven't been rescued from a storm. I haven't had a demon exercised. But I would say to you, what is the greatest miracle? A calm storm, an exercised demon, or a resurrected life? Brothers and sisters, in Christ we find purpose. In Christ we have hope. In Christ we have forgiveness. In Christ we have joy. In Christ, we are part of a new and better story. In Christ, we have eternal life. See, I have this theory and I claim no data beyond my own observations. And so please take it for what it is. The theory is this, that with all the negative coverage of Christianity in the mainstream media in recent years, I wonder whether we're letting ourselves off the hook. And of course, it's never nice to hear your faith spoken of negatively and at times aggressively. 
but I wonder whether we're using that narrative as an excuse not to share the gospel. My concern is that we're telling ourselves that nobody is interested as an excuse to remain comfortable, essentially throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Feel free to challenge me on that. It's merely a theory. But what I do want to do is show you some real factual data that speaks into this situation. In my last sermon, I shared some statistics from the Faith and Belief in Australia report by the McCrindle Research Group, and I want to do some more of that today. In the report, those who identified themselves as non-Christians were asked the following question. Given the right circumstances and evidence, how open would you be to changing your current religious view? Now there's an uncomfortable question. Let's take a look at the results. Of all who were asked that question, 10% said they were very interested or quite open to have that conversation. 13% said that they would consider it. And 77% said they were unlikely or would not consider. And so what that data is telling us is that if you ask 10 people that question, you're going to get one person who's very interested to have a conversation and another one person who would consider it. Now, this isn't comfortable, don't get me wrong, because it means that statistically you're going to get knocked back eight or nine times out of ten. That makes me squirm. I'm sure it makes you squirm too. But there's also a flip side, which is this that if every single one of us at St. Matt's and All Saints asked just one person today whether they'd be open to a conversation, that would lead to between 60 and 120 opportunities to show the beauty of Christ today. Are you willing to roll the dice? If you knew you had a 10% chance of winning the lottery, I reckon you're going to be buying that ticket every single day of the week. The disciples and the demon-possessed man were awestruck by Jesus. And the more we continue to be awestruck by everything we have in him, the more likely we are to share the message and be winsome in doing so. Now, believe me that I say I don't claim to be an expert evangelist by any stretch, but I do want to share a conversation I had with a dearly loved person in my life just last year. If I had to guess, I would probably place him in the second bracket, one of the 13% who would consider a conversation, but I wouldn't say he is keenly interested. We started talking fairly normally. I mentioned how I'd really like to buy an electric car, but how expensive they still are. And I knew that my friend had always idolized Elon Musk, and so predictably he started opening up about what a hero Elon is. At one point in the conversation, I stopped and I asked him where that kind of admiration came from. And I'd assumed it was because he was such a successful entrepreneur, but I found out I was wrong in that assumption. He told me that it's because Elon Musk is a man using all of his wealth, all of his power and all of his prestige, not to accumulate riches for himself, but to invest it back into a space program that is designed to save the rest of our humanity from our dying planet. To my friend, Elon Musk had quite literally become a savior figure. And at this point, I couldn't help myself. I had to share with him how much the conclusions and hope he had in Elon were the conclusions I had made about Christ. A man who left his kingdom, who humbled himself and will rescue us into a new creation. Did my friend become a Christian at the end of the conversation? No. I still pray for him. But by the end, his girlfriend was now in the room, listening intently, sharing her own views on the afterlife. And my friend told me that he definitely hadn't made up his mind, and that while still agnostic, he was definitely open to more conversations. And my encouragement is this in telling you that story, brothers and sisters, to not be tempted to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Eight or nine out of 10 is not 10 out of 10. And while rejection will always hurt, there are still opportunities to be had. One of the punchiest quotes about evangelism that you may well have heard before is from Penn Jillette, who is a part of the magician duo Penn and Teller. Now, ironically, he's an atheist, 
but has articulated the situation perhaps better than anyone else I've read, Christian or not. Here's what he says. I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe there is a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think it is not really worth telling them because it would make it socially awkward. I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you, and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there is a certain point I would tackle you. And this is more important than that. I don't know if I could articulate it any better. Now, I want to acknowledge that for every single one of us, this is not just theoretical. This is about real people we love dearly, whether living or past. How do we come to terms with this and its consequences? We do so by remembering that Jesus doesn't ask you to be the saviour. He is the saviour. In view of the Holy Spirit, our mission is not to convert as many people as we can. No, our mission is to love, and part of that is to tell as many people as we can, to pray for as many people as we can. And we ask the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do. Love your neighbour, Jesus says. That is not the same as save your neighbour. And that's the only way you can be bold in sharing your faith in a way that also gives you deep rest in your soul if it doesn't go well. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to condemn you today. My purpose here is not to guilt you. I want to give you a message of opportunity, of hope and expectancy in the fact that God is still powerfully at work, even in Australia in 2020. And if you're watching as a person who is interested in exploring further, I want to ask you who you think Jesus is. And if eternal life was really a possibility, wouldn't that at least be worth a conversation? I would love to chat further with you about that. And I'm sure there are people in your life who would too. And whether you come to put your faith in Jesus or not, can I say the weight of what Christians claim is on the line is too important not to at least explore. And please know that we will still love you either way, no matter what you end up deciding. Brothers and sisters, who is that person in your life that God is putting on your heart right now? Who is the person that you've been praying for for years, but those prayers are slowly trickling away? Who is the person you've only known for a little while, but you do wonder where they're at with God? In the next few months, we have John Dixon returning to West Pimble and West Linfield to share about what difference God makes when we experience pain and suffering which is all too relevant given everything that's happened this year. Who do you know who might benefit from hearing him speak? And if not that, how can you take the informal opportunities over a coffee to chat to those in your life? Remember, the data is showing the person that your loved one trusts more than anyone in the world to have a conversation with is you. You may not feel eloquent, But God's Spirit works through that and He gives us evangelists to partner with. But you're going to at least need to start the conversation yourself. A one in ten chance to win the lottery. Would you take it? I suppose, like the disciples, like the demon-possessed man, like the Gerasenes, it depends on who you think Jesus is. It depends on whether you think He has the authority and the power. The disciples ask themselves, who is this man? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. His name is Jesus and he's the Christ. And with his authority, he commands the demon-possessed man to return home and tell how much God has done for you.
hello. It's uh, great to be with you today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Have a listen to these words uh, of our Lord Jesus. He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. It's hard uh, not to ponder those words just for a moment and go, Yeah, nah, that's not me. The reality is, we fail to honour our God and Creator. We're not righteous in the way we relate to him. Every single moment of every single day, we need grace. And of course, this is what we find in our Lord Jesus Christ. We've just been hearing about how Jesus has all authority and power in heaven and on earth. And yet, what does he do with that power and authority? He becomes a servant. He, he lays down his life. He takes away that dishonour and unrighteousness so that we can stand as his dearly beloved children. And that is what we get to remember and delight in right now, uh, to feed on these wonderful truths deep, deep down in our very souls. Let's get ready for that right now by first acknowledging together our deep, deep need in the words of this confession. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbour as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbour, and to live for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the face of that need, this is what Jesus did and said on the night before he died. Firstly, he took some bread, and when he had given God thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup and again, giving God thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Do you hear what's being said here? Jesus, in his life, death and resurrection, has paid it all so we don't have to. So whether it's for the first time or whether you've been doing this all your life, uh, please take up a bit of bread. Take and eat this in remembrance that Jesus' body was given for you and be thankful. And take up this cup. Take and drink this in remembrance that the blood of Jesus was shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much uh, that we get to uh, delight in, be nourished by, be fed by these deep, deep truths of the gospel that our Lord and Saviour has died, has been raised again and he gives us life. He takes away all our sins and gives us new life with you. Heavenly Father, in view of all your mercies, please take us and use us to love and serve you and all people. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Today, um, as we heard from Chippo, our mission of love is to tell and pray for as many people as we can, telling them about the great news we have in Jesus. So today um, at Prayer Home, there'll be a prayer card, which will be in your family pack. So it's like this, and there's a bit of a blank area, so near the word tell. And I want you guys to write a name um, of a person who doesn't know Jesus. And adults, you can do this too, or you can think of five people you would like to invite to church. Now, this could be a friend, a family member, 
um, a co-worker, or even a friend from school. And what I want you to do is to cut it out, write the name of the friend, and then um, I want you guys to pray for them. Now, this prayer will really help you um, to ask God for opportunities to tell them about the great news we have in Jesus. But I don't want you just to do it now, but actually um, as you go out, go out through the week and also throughout the month as well. Now, you also may want to discuss um, of who the person is uh, with your family, which would be great as well. But before that, I will pray, and then after, um, you'll see Lara and Ella Cipollone, um will be doing a prayer as well. So let me pray. Uh, dear God, thank you so much um, for this day. Thank you that you are a powerful God and that your authority is everywhere and all over the universe. I just pray that you will give us um, opportunities to go out and to tell many people about your power, but also your love as well. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that Jesus is powerful. Thank you that he is loving. Help us to be brave, to share our faith. We pray that the Holy Spirit will work in people's hearts so they put their faith in Jesus. Amen. Amen. God. 
wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord Beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy Lord, God of wonders. Hey guys, uh, before I wrap up, we have two uh, announcements. The first one is the K-Divive Zoom chat at 10 a.m. Um, so it's a really awesome time for kids to continue on what we've learned today, but also many other activities as well. And now the second uh, announcement, which is amazing. It is Josh's birthday. Happy birthday, mate. <coughs> oh, it worked. Um, happy birthday, mate. We're so encouraged what you do here at church. I hope you have a great day too. Well, anyway, what we have heard from today is that Jesus is powerful and has authority over everything. At the start, we saw how the Queen, ScoMo, and Baz are all in charge of many things. But Jesus is in charge of everything, from the winds and the waves and even stopping demons. We should have fear of amazement of what Jesus can do and what he did for us on the cross. Like Chippo said, we should be going out and telling the great news of what Jesus has done for us. His, his amazing power is just awesome. So keep your prayer cards like uh, back in the prayer activity. Um, keep on praying for that one person. Or if you have five, uh, keep on praying um, throughout this week or throughout any time as well. Well, I hope you had a great time. It's good to see you. Uh, I'll see you later. Have a good week. <laughs>